In my last video we looked at this 3D renderer here, which can render an image by shooting rays into the scene, which we then intersect with spheres. And we can also move the camera around, so this was a fully functioning 3D environment. Now in this video we are going to shade the spheres, add ray trace shadows and reflections. Alright, so this time I rendered these three images, which is almost like a small animation. As you can see I'm now using a map display, which is a lot better than the one from my last video. But before we talk about the display, what do we actually see here? Here is a blender simulation, which makes it a bit easier to see. We have two spheres, we have light coming from the top left, which shades both of the spheres. The top sphere is also casting a shadow onto the bottom sphere. And because this is a simple ray trace shadow, it has perfectly sharp outlines. And as you might be able to tell, the first sphere is also reflective, so it reflects the sky around it. And we can also see the other sphere inside the reflections. And inside the reflections we can also see the shadow here again, so this time we are shooting a lot more rays to calculate all of this. Let's say this here is the camera, and to calculate the color of one pixel, we first shoot a primary ray, which then intersects the objects in our scene. In this case we have the first hit point right here. And now we can calculate the amount of light this point receives from the light source. And because this object is reflective, we also need to calculate the reflections. Which means we have to let this ray bounce off the surface. And then we shoot our second ray starting at this first hit point. And here we have our second intersection point. And now we can also calculate the amount of light this surface point receives. But of course we also need to check if this point is in shadow or not. And we can do this by shooting a so called shadow ray, starting at this point and we shoot it in the direction from which the light is coming. If this ray is blocked by an object, in our case the sphere, we know that the surface point cannot receive any direct light from our light source. So this point is in shadow. In case you want to know how this works in detail, I have made a tutorial series in the past about this. In Blender we can also play around with a few variables. For example we can change the position of this sphere by changing the coordinates. And we can also change the direction from which the light is coming. And in Minecraft we can do the same. So let's first reset everything and update the map. And then we can enter the same coordinates that we used in Blender here but we have to use binary, so only zeros and ones. And then we can start the rendering here. I waited a few minutes and now if we update the map, we can see that we already have two rows of our image completed. I'm using carpet mode to speed up my game, but every pixel still takes at least 30 seconds to calculate. And the whole image takes almost two days to finish, so this is still very slow. Alright, so this here is the Redstone computer. It is mostly the same as in my last video. I just made it a lot more compact and added a few things. Here we have different types of memory to store values. This here is some specialized stuff to combine the shading, shadow and reflection data. Then here we have addition, subtraction, sign pitch shifting and multiplication. Now in my last video we also had a divider, which was this huge thing here in the back. And that's no longer here, because I wanted to try using some approximations so that this ray tracer only uses addition, subtraction and multiplication. Because there is something really satisfying about only using these super basic operations. In the end you can't even tell the difference because it's being displayed on such a bad display in Minecraft. Now all these components that I just mentioned can be controlled here. There are 50 different instructions and they are arranged in two layers on top of each other. And each of these instructions does a specific thing inside the computer when I send a pull signal down its wire. This part here stores the program, which is basically just a pattern that describes in which order these instructions should be executed. I explained this in more detail in my last video if you're interested. 
Now the program has around 260 lines of code and it is structured in a way that is very similar to functions in programming. For example, one part of the code does the main line sphere intersections, another part can reflect the ray and so on. Now this green part here allows me to basically jump around inside the program. It lets me move the reading position vertically and horizontally. So we can basically do simple if-else statements. For example, first the program checks if the ray intersects any of the two spheres and if not it will just output the sky color to the display. We don't have to calculate all the fancy reflections and shadows in this case. And this makes pixels that only show the sky run very fast. The final color that I send to the display is basically just a number between 0 and 63, which describes how bright the pixel is that we just calculated. So we have 64 different shades of grey, and at this stage the image would look like this. But because our Minecraft map display cannot display this, we first have to process this data. And this is what this component here does. Minecraft maps can only display like 11 different grey colors. You can get a lot more if you use something called staircasing, where you basically build the blocks higher or lower than the previous block. And I have written a script in the past which can print very detailed map arts by using this staircasing technique. I think this one uses like 24 shades of grey. But this would be extremely complicated to build as a working redstone display. So in vanilla Minecraft without any custom texture bags and other tricks, I'm kind of stuck with these 11 colors. Now, with these 11 colors, our smooth gradients have turned into really ugly color banding artifacts. To get rid of these, we can use something called dithering. There are different ways to do this. The most simple way is to just add some noise to the original image. For example, here I have a smooth black to white gradient. And let's say I want to display this gradient with just two colors, black and white. This would look something like this. If the threshold is at 50%, of course we get the border exactly in the center of the gradient. But now let's add some noise to the original image. And as you can see, the more noise we add, the better these two colors are blended together. In this case I used so-called blue noise, which looks a lot more uniform than regular white noise. And instead of noise, you can also just use a checkerboard pattern. It works pretty good for low resolution images. So this part here does the dithering with a checkerboard pattern and to do that, depending on the pixel coordinates, it either adds or subtracts a certain number from the brightness value. And then finally, this part here assigns the color an index between 0 and 10. So it decides which Minecraft block best represents this brightness value. It basically does a series of greater than comparisons and I can adjust the individual thresholds to remap this gradient however I want. So I can apply all kinds of tone maps and color adjustments here at the end. The output here is a signal strength between 0 and 10, which is then sent to the display. And the display converts the signal strength to a pulse of a specific length and this pulse is then sent to the correct pixel. And inside the pixel, the pulse is converted back into a signal strength, which then activates a certain amount of pistons so that the block at the top is the color that should be visible on the map. This here is basically the module for a single pixel. It has to be very compact and most importantly, it cannot interfere with the neighboring pixels. And I also need to be able to reset all the pixels with just one signal. Another thing that I tried to simulate in this ray tracer is the so-called Fresnel effect, which is extremely important whenever you draw, paint or render anything reflective. Here we have two reflective objects, but the reflections look a bit flat and boring. This is because every pixel shows the same amount of reflections, and this is not what we see in reality. For example, the reflections on this train here are barely visible. But if we look further away, the reflections get stronger and stronger. And this also happens from another angle. We always see this gradient. And this also happens on water. If we look down, almost perpendicular to the surface, we see very weak reflections and we can see the ground below. But when we look up, almost parallel to the surface, it looks almost perfectly reflective. So we see a gradient again. So most surfaces tend to be much more reflective if you look at a shallow angle compared to a more perpendicular angle. So if we apply this effect to our example, the reflections look a bit more realistic. Near the edges, the reflections are much stronger now, and in the center they are actually weaker than before. It's not physically accurate in this case, 
but most of the time it actually looks better if you exaggerate this effect. And in my ray trace I also simulate this Fresnel effect. It makes this sphere look a bit more shiny than without it. Alright, in conclusion this second version of the ray tracer was quite challenging to make, mainly because I wanted to reuse as much as possible from the last version. So I had to cut a few corners, for example I ended up using an orthographic camera system, which allows me to simplify a lot of the mathematics for the primary ray intersection. Otherwise I would probably need to build all this here from scratch again, because I wouldn't be able to fit the whole program in just 280 lines of code. I also noticed some precision issues at certain light angles. And there are probably still a lot of bugs. But yeah, the whole thing is a nightmare to debug, because you can only test individual pixels at a time. 